Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter and welcome to another exciting service from TNT Church here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. I'm Assistant Pastor Dan Davey, and we invite you to join our worship service here on the Easter Sunday morning. And what's so special about Easter? Why does that mean so much to so many people? Well, it's, it really sets us apart from every other religion in the world because it talks about Jesus Christ being risen from the dead that God loved us so much that he wanted to come and be with us. And he did that, walked for 33 years on the earth, and then died on Good Friday yesterday. And we would, uh, we would say, wow, what a, what a sad time. And yet, it's not the end of the story. And that's what we're celebrating this morning, the end of the story. And so I think you're going to be touched by what the Lord does uh, to show you how much he loves you, that he rose from the dead, he gave us a fresh start, and he can do that for you today. We're trusting and praying that God will speak to your heart this morning. We're going to uh, invite my friend Chuck to open our service for us this morning. God bless you. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to wish everybody a happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Chuck Chiaramonti, and I am a member at the New Testament Church, and I am uh, just going to take a couple of minutes to speak to you about this morning, um, about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, I wish we could be together this morning. Uh, I was kind of hoping we would be together by now, worshiping together and, and uh, mind and spirit. Unfortunately, uh, uh, that didn't happen. And uh, I'm just hoping and praying that uh, we can see each other and get together soon. Where two or three are gathered in my name, uh, uh, I am with you. So uh, I, am, I am definitely hoping and praying for that. So as we prepare for our hearts and minds um, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize today that as believers, um, we're celebrating the most historical and significant event in human history. This weekend, we, you know, uh, we talked about the, uh, the burial, um, the death burial, and, and then the key process, which is the resurrection of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And uh, because of that, we have hope. We have, we have grace and we have mercy from God who, uh, who had his son die on the cross for, for us so that we would have this opportunity to have a relationship with him. Uh, I want to read this morning in uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3, says the following. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So he's given us new birth. And from that new birth, we have a living hope, a true hope, a true a hope that is rooted in reality. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians 2, he said, the reality is found in Christ. Jesus is the reality. His death, burial, and resurrection is the reality. Everything else is a shadow. Everything else is temporary. It's here today, gone tomorrow in 1 Peter chapter 2, the next chapter, when he quotes Isaiah, he says, All men are like grass, all, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field, and the grass withers, and the flowers fail. And then the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19 through 20, I'm paraphrasing, he says, If the hope we have in Christ is only in this world, would it be pitied more than, than all men? Because it would be in vain. If the resurrection didn't happen, all our, it didn't happen. All of our, all of our works, all of our, everything that we do, everything that we stood for, everything we hoped for would be vain. It would come to nothing because it's temporary. But in verse twenty, Paul says, "But Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. Did indeed rise from the dead, and for that we have hope." So though we struggle today with our current circumstances, we can still celebrate because it doesn't change who God is or what He has done for us. He is risen, and for that, we don't have false hope, but we have a blessed hope. Amen? So, Lord, we just thank you for this day and this opportunity for us to celebrate together, even if it's via uh, a remote setting, Lord. Uh, we know that you're with us, Lord, and uh, we just pray that you touch each and every one of us as uh, we go through with worship. Uh, we pray for the worship team as uh, they come forth with some songs. We pray for the for the sermon today, Lord, that uh, that, this, that the sermon that is brought forth will touch our hearts and help us get through these unusual and, and dire circumstances that we're in, Lord. But we know that you're in control. 
We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and everything that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're glad you're with us this morning as we sing a few songs together. We pray that you're blessed, that you appreciate these old hymns like we do. Uh, they're not easy to sing, but we just want to give glory to God this morning. We're thankful for you guys. We pray that you're blessed by the service and all the specials that go on today in service. And uh, we're just glad you're here. Amen. Bless you guys.
thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We pray you're blessed and uh, you enjoy the message. Amen.
My name is Pastor Paul Jaley of the New Testament Church. I'm the senior pastor and uh, want to just thank those who have been involved here in the service, uh, Assistant Pastor Dan Davey, who gave the introduction, and Chuck Giamonti, the opening, and Chuck Lindbergh and his family uh, leading us in worship uh, with Chloe and uh, Aubrey and Haley, and, um, and we're so thankful that uh, uh, Debbie Harris could do the dance that she had prepared for Easter. Uh, that's a real blessing. And I want to share with you some thoughts about the resurrection and why it is so imperative that we remind ourselves clearly of how important the resurrection is, not just in history, but personally in our lives. And so uh, let's, let's uh, read a couple of passages of scripture around which I'm going to mold my remarks. And the first is from John 14, 19. It says, a little while longer, and the world, Jesus is speaking now, the world will see me no more. But you, he's speaking to the disciples, will see me. Because I live, you shall live also. And then out of 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul there is saying in verse 14, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then your preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for the words of your scripture. We pray, God, that it will inspire us. We pray, Lord, it would encourage us during this particular time and not only give us hope, but confidence that you are not only alive today, but you're still victorious in spite of what we may see and in spite of how we may feel. So we'll thank you for that now as we open up your word in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting that the disciples, when Jesus announced that he was the Messiah to them and they began one by one to catch on to that revelation. The disciples assumed, it's a major presumption, but they had it so much ingrained in their mind, that he was going to come as a military leader, a conqueror, and vanquish the Roman Empire. After all, they'd been under tyranny. And the Jews in Israel had been under tyranny for centuries. And they so longed to get the uh, tyrannical uh, control of Rome off their backs. And after all, one of the ways that they believed this was because of the way they interpreted the prophet Daniel, and particularly chapter 2 when he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I want to just read that as a preface to my remarks today. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 and 35, this was the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. It says, he saw a stone cut out without hands, which struck the image. This is this massive image now. Uh, has gold head and all the way down to the feet of iron and clay. And he broke them in pieces after it hit and smashed the feet. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, when Daniel interpreted the dream, he put it this way to Nebuchadnezzar. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall stand forever. You see, the Jews understood at the time of Jesus that the fourth kingdom that was described here in Daniel's vision was the Roman Empire. And it had feet mixed with iron and clay because the Roman Empire, in spite of all its control, could never bring unity. And they desired uniformity in many ways, but then they realized they had to allow some diversity but without any internal covenant of unity, no, nothing where people could truly agree with any absolute value, Rome was always on the brink of potential destruction unless uh, it could just exhibit that external control. And so the disciples believed, hey, this stone, whatever this thing is, cut out without hands, going to smash the Roman Empire and is going to destroy it and the mountain of God's kingdom will fill the whole earth. And they recognized this. In fact, if I read that and I was a Jew at that time, I'd probably think the same thing. Sounds pretty military to me to smash an image to bits and pieces. But you see, they missed something. And the key is that even in the Old Testament, the way the nation of Israel was structured, God's kingdom itself is not a centralized tyranny that flows power from the top. No, uh, the king of kings, Jesus, 
came to the earth as a baby, was born of a virgin, that's the stone cut out without hands, without human agency, born and got Jesus through those life called ordinary people. Think of the disciples. How diverse could they be? You have a tax collector on one hand. You've got fishermen on the other. You've got individuals that were considered so lowly. Uh, think of the women. You have, you've got all those individuals who came out of uh, some sordid backgrounds and, and others of all kinds that were there. Jesus called ordinary people to follow him. And it's interesting that uh, when he died on the cross for them, uh, by rising from the dead, and this is the key point, the resurrection itself is the very act that would allow Jesus to live inside his own subjects in the kingdom. A unique concept that was not understood by any kingdom and any historical analogy in the Old Testament, other than Israel itself. God's kingdom is the most unique kingdom, the only one where the king lives in his subjects. But you see, the disciples were lost to this idea, and Jesus, as much as he would teach it, that no, God's kingdom doesn't come from the outside in and the top down. It doesn't come from violence and conquest and, and whatnot. It comes by God first conquering sin within, and then we learn to serve, and we learn to bless people, and we learn to give, and we do that in such a way by love. And this brings us now to the aspect of this, because it's this prediction that, no, I, I need to go away. In John chapter 14, now in the whole chapter of 14 of John and verses subsequent that follow that as well, uh, it's taking place right after the supper, the last supper. Here Jesus is, uh, and he's finished the meal, and he begins to teach them. Now you have to realize that the week prior to Jesus' death and resurrection is the most intense week. It builds in suspense, and it builds in anticipation. It's the most intense, week-long, college-level course the disciples ever got in their three years of ministry. It's a crescendo. More than a third of the Gospels are in that last week. And here, Jesus is teaching them the intense truths of the kingdom of God. And yet, they're thinking of all kinds of things. They realize the pressure and the tension with the Pharisees and potentially the Romans from Palm Sunday on was getting really tense. So John 14, 19, that first passage, I want you to think of this phrase, because I live, Jesus says, you shall live. Now, of course, what Jesus was talking about is, listen, I'm going to, the Son of Man must give up his life. And you're going to think I've gone away. And the world's going to think I'm gone. But I'm not gone very long. In fact, I will be, I'll be right back. This was not talking about the second coming here. The context is, I'm going to be right back in a resurrected body. And you are going to see me, my disciples, because primarily he revealed himself in his resurrected body to disciples and to believers. Though others probably saw it and recognized it still, that was his main point, to confirm to them he is alive, because the resurrection is the cornerstone to the Christian life. So he said, look, and you're, going to, you're going to see me. And they recognize, what is he talking about? He'd be crucified. The world would think, hey, he's gone. We've got rid of him. Uh, he's now no longer here. And yet, this is not what Jesus was saying. He would rise and they would see him. And Jesus declared this a little bit later in that same chapter in the same context. He said, look, it's very good that I go away. I said, what? What are you going away for? Where, where are you going to go? And how can we get there? He said, well, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, where I'm going is a spiritual place of resurrection. I'm going to be living in full resurrection life. Jesus already had it. He's fully God, fully man. But now I'm going to be in a place where uh, it is so powerful that by the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, the Father, the Spirit, and I in spirit are going to come and live inside of you. We're going to make our home in your hearts. And this was just so far, so foreign to them. And think of it, the Roman and Greek culture that surrounded them at the time, this was so foreign. Bodily resurrection was considered a joke. It, you were considered to be mentally ill, literally. If you really believe that someone could be resurrected from the dead physically, bodily, and come back sane. In fact, the Roman Empire believed that, and many about things about ghosts and wicked spirits, oh, they believed those things existed. And they believed the dead could return, sort of like the zombie craze we have today. 
those zombies, oh yeah, uh, that's what it would be. But they're, they're grotesque. They're not, they're not normal. They're not human. They're not a, a glorified body. It's almost a decayed body. It's a, it's a, it's a grotesque form. No, this is, the resurrection was a, a, a perfectly formed body, recognizable by other people. And Jesus said, listen, this is what's going to happen. Well, it's so far, they could not conceive of such a thing. And yet it's the cornerstone. It's the crux of it. It's very difficult. Uh, and, you know, this idea, and where does this lead to? It leads to conversion. He says, because I live, you will live. I'm going to live inside of you. The only way that's going to happen, as he spoke to Nicodemus, was the only way you're going to see the kingdom, the only way you're going to enter the kingdom, is if you are regenerated, born from above. We often call it born again, but the idea is born from heaven, an encounter with heaven, an encounter with Jesus. Because Jesus, my friend, right now is alive. You can encounter his love. You can encounter his wisdom. You can encounter his power inside of you by surrendering to him and saying, Lord, I need you. And this is what Jesus was communicating to the disciples. And you have to understand that the Roman Empire, again, had no thought, neither the Greeks, for any form of conversion. The Roman religion was additive. It was the idea that when you, when you picked up a new thought, you just added it to the previous thought. It was not an actual demarcation from going from one kingdom to another. It was not being translated into with your heart and your wisdom and, uh, and, your, uh, and love in a whole different way. No, 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 no. This was simply uh, in the Roman Empire, in the Greek Empire, there was no concept of this kind of conversion. And this thought of actually choosing to surrender to a resurrected Christ unheard of. And so the idea is an encounter with the Spirit. So the first point I want to make is this. The resurrection is what allows you and I to walk with God today. Without the resurrection, we'd be merely rehearsing the memory of a dead Savior. We'd be rehearsing the memory of what he taught. But it would have no more power than any other religion that's just talking about, hey, this is what a good teacher taught. These are powerful words. You can try to follow them in your own strength. you will be better than not following them. That's certainly true. But Christianity is built on something totally different. It's built on the Savior living inside the saved, inside the converted, and living his life out through them by their progressive surrender to his lordship in every area of life. This is unheard of. This is so unique. And it's only possible because Jesus rose from the dead. Now, second thing, if we go to 1 Corinthians 15, we understand that he said this, if Jesus, if there was no resurrection of the dead, which the Romans didn't believe there was any resurrection of the dead, um, they, they did not believe in that at all. He said, look, he references that because he knew where they were. He understood, uh, Paul the Apostle understood it. He was trained in it. He understood Roman and Greek thought. He said, look, if there is no resurrection, then obviously Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, your preaching is in vain. Or in other words, the words of the Bible, which they had the Old Testament. Remember, the New Testament was being compiled during this time. But those words in the Scripture, however great they might be, are empty because they rely totally on your strength. It's in vain if Jesus had not risen from the dead. Think of it, the idea of proclaiming absolute truth that is true in any time period, true among any people, true in any area of life, is so foreign again, to Greek and Roman thought at the time. Roman thought was all body, you know, built up on local customs. Uh, they ruled the day. Every local community had its gods, its deities. Uh, there were some trans, uh, trans gods that went to all the communities, but this was, uh, this was critical clear. And the only thing that unified everybody was the ultimate god, Caesar, or the state. Civil government was God. And therefore, if you were to disobey civil government, you disobeyed God. And this is what brought people together. The idea of teaching a truth, proclaiming a truth from the words of Scripture. Remember, it started in the home. Conversational teaching and preaching was the first mode in the early church because they had no buildings to meet in. They had no synagogues they were allowed to meet in. They merely met in homes. And sometimes they would then eventually meet in public squares, and there they could proclaim, much like we do today, the public preaching of the gospel. But you see, preaching is different than just sharing something. And if you're sharing, because you're sharing something that's true, something that holds true, rings true, and is true, but it's only true, it only is vibrant, it only reaches the heart and convicts the heart because the Lord Jesus is risen. 
Because when he's risen and the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you, the Holy Spirit is teaching you the same truth you read in the Bible on the inside, not just the outside. That's what makes preaching so powerful. Preaching is powerful not because the person is, who's speaking is a good orator. Oratory alone does not convict people's hearts. It's not uh, powerful simply because people know how to put words together. It's not the prose, not the inflection of the voice. It's not the tone or the volume of the voice. No, what makes Christian preaching from the Word of God so unique among the whole earth is that on the inside, the Holy Spirit is saying the same thing. The word that's written in the Bible is saying the same thing the Holy Spirit's speaking on the inside because the risen Savior in spirit is living inside the person. That's why Nicodemus said, how do I be, go back into my mother's womb? What are you talking about? Become born again. He said, no, that's not the case. It's the spirit of God. That's why Jesus said, it's really good that I go away because I'm sending the spirit, not a different spirit, the same kind of spirit, the same nature as me. And that's going to come inside you. And we will make our abode inside you. That's what's so powerful. And you see the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the word of God. This is what makes it powerful. You and I, when we read the scriptures in our personal time, or we share the scripture with someone else, you're not just sharing words. You're sharing something the Holy Spirit himself is trying to convey. And just because, and when Jesus is alive and the resurrection, he's the living word. He's not the dead word, he's the living word. And because of that, the living word is powerful, as Hebrews 4.12 tells us. So you see, not, not, it's not just the fact that we could never be converted or changed from one way to another, truly on the inside of our character, unless the Lord is risen again. See, Jesus intervened in the lives of Mary Magdalene and Peter and Nicodemus and others. But you see, it was not until Jesus was in the upper room with the disciples after his resurrection when he appeared that he breathed and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Because you see, receiving that Holy Spirit was the powerful way of that, that change because of his risen state. It's really powerful because that change then becomes not merely uh, borrowed or in intermediate, but it becomes permanent. It becomes powerful. But that's not the only thing. It's not just conversion, and it's not just the proclamation of the Bible, which we do and we get together in Bible studies, in church, but it also is our faith itself. First Corinthians 15 said, if Jesus Christ had not been risen, your faith is empty. Not just the preaching, your faith itself. And that's the anchor of our souls. It's the faith in God, our trust in God, our confidence in God. A lot of people are looking at things today with the coronavirus and the pandemic and people being shut up in their homes and, and others and concerns they all have about, oh my gosh, how long is this going to take place and what's going to happen? And um, are we ever going to meet again? Is this thing going to be just prolonged? What's true? What's false? All those things. And it's our trust and our faith in God that holds on. And yet he's saying this would be... Uh, totally empty. Rome and Greece focused on this life. That was all there is. Even though when you died, your soul went through all these things, it was not conscious. It was not like you had a, uh, an afterlife of conscious uh, validity of any kind. The focus was eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. The critical thing is that in 1 Corinthians 15, when Jesus said that, he said, listen, no, your faith is bound up in the resurrected Christ. Think of John 17, which was prayed by Jesus also after the Lord's Supper, just prior to Gethsemane. And think about it. He said, this is eternal life, he's praying, that they may know you, Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See, Jesus' life is eternal life. His resurrection and life that he gives, he lived in the resurrection life. That is eternal life. When we say, gee, we get eternal life, it doesn't just mean we live forever. It means we live in the power of the life of Christ. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, as Romans chapter 8 tells us. And, you know, as I, as I wrap this up, I want you to, to, to ponder a couple of things. I want to go back to Daniel's vision for just a moment of that mountain that fills the whole earth. You know, what the, what the disciples did not get was the method that Jesus was going to bring the kingdom. It was a voluntary surrender to the king of kings, the king of the universe. And love was the method. And it was personal. They should have seen it by what Jesus did during his, his life. He was firm. He rebuked the Pharisees. But there was a heart of love to try to reach them deep within it. 
And that's the kind of thing that we as Christians are obviously need to embrace. Christ the rock had come, born of a virgin. It was Christ. He was the Messiah that came. And he came, and he was the one smashing the foot, the base, the bottom of the Roman Empire. How? By building close-knit covenant communities of believers who cared for the sick in their community, who loved their neighbor, who went out of their way at the risk of their own life many times, who picked up abandoned babies at the doorsteps of the early church. You read about what the early church and believers did. They transformed the bottom of the Roman Empire. The iron and clay was there because the the belief systems they had were not permanent. They couldn't keep them through the storm. And the Christian was saying, listen, I'll love you no matter if you spit at me. I'll love you even if you don't love me. And this was so foreign. It was transforming the early church. The early church was the fastest growing movement that ever lived, was ever recorded. And eventually it toppled the Roman Empire from the inside out and the bottom up. The mountain is bigger now than it was before, that's for sure. But I want you to understand, I want to just give you some phrases out of Psalm 2. As I close, I want to be able to declare to you and proclaim to you that God, Jesus Christ, is the eternal one. Jesus Christ did not begin in the manger. He's the eternal son of God. He lived in eternity with God the Father. He has no beginning and no end. He's given the present tense of the begotten son of God because there wasn't a beginning. It was always the mystery of the Son and the Father and the Spirit. The Trinity always been with us. And the interesting thing is, in Psalm 2, we read this messianic, prophetic psalm that is the resurrected Christ. It's the eternal Christ before time began. But its value, its, its present-day application is so real because when Jesus came to the earth, now he took on flesh. The Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And then he was raised from the dead, and he is risen, not was risen. He's In the present tense, he is risen because he's alive today. Now, the, the psalm starts with this rhetorical question. Now, it's the father and the son. And the father asks, why do the nations rage and leaders take counsel together, or literally conspire together against the Lord and his anointed? Why do the nations seem in every age to somehow want to gather together in unity against Christ. Make no mistake, when tyrants rule, sure they have no regard to their people, but their ultimate anger, whether they even know it or not, is against the Lord Jesus Christ, the ruler of the nations. It's interesting that when he says against the Lord and his anointed, you know that phrase, the Lord's anointed, applies to both leaders and people. The Bible says in the Old Testament, touch not mine anointed. Now it doesn't just mean touch not the leader, of the church or something like that. No, the people of God were considered the anointed of God because that's the treasure of God. That's where God is working. They're no better than anybody else. But if you surrender to Christ and you are chosen by him, you know that you're chosen of him. Well, you, you recognize there's a certain anointing, something is special on you, not because you're better, but because you're equipped in spite of yourself by his power. He said, they go against the Lord and his anointed. Now there've always been, Kings, rulers, nations, the people, and rulers that have conspired against the Lord. There have always been conspiracies, always behind the scenes of someone trying to do it. But here's one common thing all throughout history. It's never been truly and fully successful because there's this anger against God, and yet that they don't fully succeed. Oh, they partially succeed. We see it. We see it happening. And many are concerned about that even today. But what's the method? It says here, let us break their bands and cast away their cords. Supposedly, all these nations say, let's break the bands that hold the body of Christ together. Let's break up their covenant with God and one another. And let's do this to break it up so that we can do it, divide and conquer. You see, Karl Marx did not invent conflict and crisis in order for people to use it as an excuse and exercise greater control. He didn't start it. It goes way back. But I want to give you some really good news that comes from the eternal Christ, who is alive today, who now is in the Godhead with a body, a resurrected body, because of what he did on our behalf. He was the first fruit to come, and we are those that are following, his people, his anointed. The nations often, their their methods haven't changed. But it's interesting because then the scene changes. Think of it, it's like a movie. The scene changes, and all of a sudden, the father is speaking to the son. 
in this, in this part. And when the Father is speaking to the Son, we hear these kinds of things. We hear the, we hear the following. It says, well, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Father and Son laugh at the attempt of individuals on earth to totally rid the earth of God and Christianity. They laugh. Are you kidding me? Do you really think that the secret cabals and all those people that try to do things behind the scene, uh, like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, do you really think God doesn't see? Do you really think God is scared? Oh, no. Folks, take heart. Don't be fearful of the things that are happening. Sure, we are concerned. Sure, we want to learn. I'm telling you right now, God controls history. And he is more powerful. And therefore, it's kind of like God looking at the earth rising up against him like a small child who's standing in the corner of the room, puts the hands over their eyes and says, I'm hiding. You can't see me. Everybody can see them. Well, you know what? God can see completely clearly. There's nothing hidden from the Lord. And you recognize that then God the Father declares, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So here's this conversation. The father turns to the son and says, it's too bad for all the nations that don't like me because the, the, the decision's final. Jesus is the king, and he said this. And then Jesus responds to the king, and he decrees in harmony with the decree of the father. And he says this, I will declare the decree, says the son. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. You see, Jesus already accepted the nations of his inheritance. The kingdom of God, the mountain, will fill the whole earth. It's going to happen. Oh, I understand there's things that happen in between now and then, but it's going to happen. And you recognize the son rehearses this decree with the father. The psalm then goes on to say that King Jesus will break the bands of the enemy. He will destroy the bands of the enemy. And he will be the one that says to them, serve the Lord. I warn you, serve God, kiss the son, lest he be angry. In other words, serve the Lord voluntarily. But I can tell you this, that the governments that do come against God, God will take care of. Listen, folks, we are so blessed because we live not only in this nation, we're blessed because the majority, vast majority of the communities here in the United States are working with everyone in this pandemic. But I want you to make sure you recognize deep in your heart that Jesus Christ is alive today. He holds the nations in the palm of his hand. He is the one that's going to bring history to a culmination. And that's why the end of Psalm 2 says this simple thing. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. I want to encourage you today. If you've never put your trust in God, you want to join the winning team. You want to join the team that's part of the king of the universe that is bringing all things to a culmination. Oh, it may not be in our lifetime. It may not be in our children or children's children's lifetime, but it could be. Who knows? But we know this. When the king of kings returns, it will be powerful. But you and I need to recognize he's coming back today because he rose. And because he rose in that ascension on that hill, uh, the Mount of Olives, when he ascended up with the disciples and gave them the commission to preach the gospel and see his kingdom advance. From the inside out, from Jerusalem to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. I want to say to you, you can lift your head up in these times and you can recognize God has it under control and God is the one that still rules the universe. And his mountain, his kingdom, by love, through service, through thinking of others before yourself, grows one step at a time. And therefore, ultimately, we will see his glory fill the earth. May God bless you. Your time could be now. Surrender to him and ask the Lord Jesus to come and live inside of you. And the reason he answers that prayer is because he is risen. God bless you, and may you go and have a tremendous day of resurrection, resurrection Sunday, in Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed our service. Uh, my name's Jeff Tonello. I'm gonna take a few moments here to kind of just wrap things up um, before we just go to prayer. I just wanna just share a few things from my heart this morning. You know, we will never know this side of heaven, the countless blessings we and others have 
received and the multitude of tragedies we and others have been protected from, from the result of prayer. We want our prayer life to continue as a lifestyle and not just during times such as we are experiencing. However, times like these allow us to be more focused and direct with our prayer, especially our corporate prayer. prayer. Pastor Paul had compiled a uh, prayer guide that uh, he has sent out to a lot of the local leaders, the fire department, police, um, selectmen, district attorneys, and a lot of it is also focused on praying for our first responders, our physicians, our nurses, other workers in the emergency room, um, firefighters, policemen, EMT, paramedics, all those lifting them up, along with our uh, national leaders, our uh, state and, and local leaders. And, you know, well, with all this, you know, sometimes we can get a little glimpse of, of heaven here on earth. And I just want to share something this morning um, from uh, uh, Chief Bradley, the fire chief of Plymouth, that um, he did receive one of these uh, prayer um, declarations from Paul in our church, and he shared something back to us. I think it's pretty powerful, and just, just to show that, you know, we do sometimes can get a glimpse of heaven here on earth and what prayer really does. So I just want to read that to us now. Paul, the prayers are working. Today, Plymouth's first responders receive the much needed personal protection, equipment, and from unlikely unknown, until now, people and companies. Tonight, I will get a better night's sleep knowing that my staff has the proper protective equipment, including the N95 masks so much needed. Plymouth firefighters, and police are safer now. Some of my worries are relieved. My staff relies on me to provide them with supplies and equipment for them to do their jobs safely. Them and their families are better protected. The prayers are working. The sun will shine through. Thank you and your congregation, and thank God for providing us with hope, Chief Bradley. So we never just know what our prayers, the impact that we can have by just lifting up those in this time, like as you know, we talked about our first responders, our, the physicians, all those that are there that are just in the front lines, just doing the battle that's before them at this time. So, you know, with the uh, last few weeks, how things have just kind of just built it with the, the, the total of deaths that have just seemed to be a little bit more mounting, it just becomes a little bit more like, what's going on here? But if you remember some of the, the uh, experts that have been talking about it, um, that the, what we see today is a result from maybe what happened two weeks ago. So even though it seems like the death total has increased somewhat, what's on a positive side of that is that the admission rate in the emergency room seems to be going down, especially in a lot of different areas, what they call the, the hot spots. And, you know, I work in orthopedics as a physician's assistant. And when we, um, when someone has a broken bone and we put it in a cast and we see them in two to three weeks after the cast first goes on, you take an x-ray and you can see a little hint of something there, which is called callus. And that's early bone that's healing. And sometimes the patient looks like that and gets a little discarded and say, well, I don't see a whole lot there. I go, well, you know, often what you see on x-ray actually lags behind a couple weeks of what's actually going on in, from the biology standpoint. X-ray can only show it in a certain time element, but actually if you see something going on at that point in time, you know that it's even more advanced than it actually is. So it's actually an encouraging sign. So I kind of say that to say that, you know, from two weeks ago and to where we are today, and that's why they can kind of say that, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel because of just how the admission rate is, seems to be going down, even though as the death total seems to be going up somewhat. But those people were, necess were probably admitted about a week or two ago, and that's why we kind of have that little bit of a discrepancy in, in these numbers and, and the thought process behind it. 
So I just wanted to kind of give you a little synopsis of that before we just close in prayer this morning. And, and again, I, I like to just thank you for joining us this morning. I know it's a, an opportunity just to just get the word out, just get encouragement out, just to be able to just touch base with the body of Christ. And all of you that just maybe just tuning in for the first time with us, or, you know, we just want to just pray for you and just, you know, just thank you for just joining us this morning. Just know that God is in control and we will not only see the light at the tunnel, but we'll see that bright light that'll shine forever. And that's Jesus and his resurrection power. So let's just bow as we pray and close this morning. So Father God, I'm just so thankful, Lord God, just for your answer to prayer, Lord God. For we know not t sometimes, Lord God, that um, the prayers that we lift up before you, Lord God, the answers of how they may come in ways that we may not expect, Lord God. But we know, Father God, that you answer in your perfect way, your perfect time, Lord God. So, Father, I just thank you for that. And I know there's a, there's a song sometimes we sing, though it seems I am not, I am always working, and you truly are, God. You're working. Your timing is perfect, Lord God. So, Father, we continue to lift up our, our, our national leaders, Lord God, for the, for the task force, Lord God, that's led by uh, Vice President Pence, Lord God. Continue to pray for Governor Baker, Lord God, for us for our other state and local leaders, Lord God, for our police departments, our fire departments, our first responders, Lord God, for the physicians, nurses, and those, Lord God, on the front lines, Lord God, doing battle for this virus that has come upon us, Lord Jesus. And Father, we just trust in your sovereign power, your sovereign will, Lord God, through such a time as this, Lord God. And Father, through this all, Lord God, we give you the glory and the honor that's due unto your name. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of us said, amen. God bless each and every one of you. Enjoy your Resurrection Sunday. Amen.